thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna get straight into this. Uh, so, psycholinguistics is the cognitive science that I'm going to use in my paper, and it is the cognitive science that studies the production and comprehension of language. This means that, on the one hand, it aims to understand how utterances are produced beyond grammar by pinpointing the psychological processes that lie behind grammar. On the other hand, it aims to understand how the linguistic input is processed by the human mind, that is, to understand what cognitive mechanisms are activated when words are perceived in hearing or reading, alongside the concomitant paralinguistic or visual information. Much experimental literature in psycholinguistics looks into how sentences are parsed and comprehended and seeks to identify features of the linguistic input that affect this process. In my own research, I have worked with the theoretical and analytical outcomes of this effort as a way of cracking the code of a number of remarks and concepts of ancient Greek critics and rhetoricians, and ultimately, to learn lessons about how native speakers of classical Greek process their own language, so that we modern critics could attempt to replicate to some, some extent their way of reading an ancient text. But let us proceed in order. Ancient Greek literary critics build on concepts and insights from the rhetorical tradition in order to identify and describe the psychological and aesthetic effects of language. In general, they ascribe such effects to figures and their combinations, as well as to structural and phonetic features of stretches of language. If we wish to read and use their work as evidence for the native perception of classical Greek, we might not always be in the position to take the remarks and observations at face value. To begin with, we need to take into account the potential prescriptive bias of ancient rhetorical and critical literature. That is, we may often suspect that critics frame their observations in such a way as to fit their own theoretical and didactic purposes. So this is how such materials can often have more of a prescriptive than a purely descriptive character. In a way, we need to reach beyond this and try to understand what was going on in the critics' mother tongue minds. We are in a better position if we look at hands-on examples and demonstrations of the rhetorical qualities of a text. Critics address an audience of native or at least highly proficient speakers or readers of classical Greek, and the points they make are meant to appeal and be convincing to the native ear. Native speakers should be, should be uh, able to actually feel the effects that critics claim to be produced. In this perspective, examples may be construed as experimental material designed by critics for this purpose, whether they are entirely made up, as is, as is often the case with examples in rhetorical handbooks, or they consist of manipulations of passages from literary texts. This is precisely what the ancient critical method of metathesis is about. Ancient, Greek, uh, ancient critics rewrote sentences or passages to show either how bad the style of that passage was, if their metathesis was meant to improve it, or how good it was, if no improvement was shown to be possible. In some cases, they just tried to provide an alternative without implying that it was better or worse than the original. Metathesis was su supposed to call on the empirical judgment of the readers. Dionysus of Halicarnassus, for instance, is very explicit on this point, and I'm reading number one on your handout. So any reader can judge for himself whether my argument is sound and Isocrates is inferior in these qualities by examining the passage which, which I have just quoted. The very first idea could have been expressed in a few words, but he spins it out by circumlocution and by saying the same thing, same thing two or three times. And then further on he quotes and comments on Isocrates, and afterwards he, he argues that it would have been possible to make one period out of two and a more elegant one at that in the following way, etc., etc. So now, it is hard to imagine that texts selected for the exercise of metathesis would be chosen following a purely ideological criterion. I mean, one assumes that certain stylistic features are good or bad, one identifies such features in a text and argues on their basis that that text is good or bad, and then one rewrites the text, altering the features and turn it in, turning, in, it, turning it into a worse or better version. So an empirical selection process is easier to envisage. So we start from the empirical effect of the text, 
So a text is selected because it feels good or bad. Certain features that are supposed to be good or bad are recognized in that text. And once again, one may rewrite the text, altering those features and turn it, turning it into a worse or better version. So if this reasoning is correct, we can conclude that the method of metathesis was affected if both the original and the rewritten text had the intended effect on the reader in the first place. Only in this case would the critic's argument be persuasive. As I argued before, examples and demonstrations of the rhetorical qualities of texts and passages may be analyzed in, a, in an appropriate framework for the purpose of reconstructing the native comprehension of classical Greek. If you are able to read into the critics' cognitive processes as they describe the effect of a stretch of language, we may be able to extract well-defined principles that we may then apply to other ancient texts in order to approximate the native perception of the linguistic material they consist of. So now, the rhetorical quality that relates most directly to language comprehension is clarity, safeneia, in the ancient Greek rhetorical literature. So it is only natural to examine in the first place discussions and demonstrations of this quality in the light of psycholinguistic models of language uh, comprehension. So clarity uh, was recognized throughout the ancient Greek tradition from Aristotle onwards as essential to any well-composed text, almost as a requirement for a text to be grammatical from a rhetorical point of view. However, uh, the notion of clarity is anything but simple. First of all, clarity can be conceived of as an end state of communication. So clarity is a mental state which the sender of a linguistic message should aim to generate in the receiver. At the same time, Clarity may be conceived of as a feature of the message itself. So in this respect, it may operate at different levels. The ancient rhetoricians distinguish between clarity concerning words, which I will call processability, and clarity concerning the subject matter, which I will call understandability. On the one hand, understandability is intrinsic to the content of a text. On the other, it may be optimized or disrupted by the way in which content is organized and presented in discourse. So less than optimal understandability does not entail that uh, the verbal input is impossible to process, of course, but it makes it difficult for the receiver to get a clear grasp of the subject matter. This, in turn, so this type of obscurity need not result in mental obscurity as an end state of communication. So the end state may still be safeneia. So actually, as ancient uh, rhetoricians recognize, uh, and Aristotle himself, a little content obscurity, so a little effort required of, this, of the uh, um, addressee of the audience to understand the message, well, this could be uh, instrumental to triggering cognitive processes leading to a deeper understanding of a message. So as is the case with allegory and reticence, for instance. So bad, disruptive obscurity instead is the one affecting the processability of a stretch of language. So no text can be called well composed unless each speech act is fully comprehensible from a syntactic, phonological, lexical and semantic point of view. Processability is precisely what sentence processing models in psycholinguistics seem to assess. And I guess that understandability would be more of the domain of cognitive linguistics, as far as I understand, and I look forward to learning more on this at uh, this conference. So this means that the ancient critics' observations and examples of form clarity and form obscurity, uh, which have to do with processability, can be reverse engineered with the help of the toolbox provided by current research in psycholinguistics. So, um, we need to uh, keep this distinction in mind, the distinction between form and content when it comes to clarity, when we select materials and when we, uh, well, we uh, analyze materials in this perspective. So the, this exercise of rever uh, re reverse engineering uh, such ancient discussions of uh, processability rests on the assumption that the human parser, so the way in which humans are wired to process language, uh, 
um, is the same for contemporary speakers of any language as well as uh, for uh, ancient speakers of, of dead languages. So this does not mean that the comprehension processes are assumed to be exactly the same for all languages. As a matter of fact, theories that account well for the comprehension of English, for instance, are often challenged when applied to other modern languages. And a controversial and universal feature of human language comprehension is the fact that it is an incremental process. So as we encounter words, either in reading or listening, we tend to extract as much linguistic information as possible from each word and to maximize the interpretation of the part of utterance or of, of part of a sentence, if you're reading, that we have already perceived. And we don't wait for the utterance or sentence to be complete in order to start processing it and start comprehending it. So this means that when we read or hear each word in a sentence, we do a, a number of cognitive operations. Um, so we uh, retrieve the meaning of the word from a mental lexicon. We assign uh, each word a referent, uh, if necessary, as it's necessary with relative anaphoric and demonstrative words, for instance. And we generate a mental representation of the syntactic relationships as they build up. So as new words are encountered, we try to integrate them into this partially passed structure as soon as, as soon as we can. So in certain languages, this cognitive buildup of comprehension appears to be driven especially by probabilistic expectations. So the more expected an element is at a certain point in a sentence, the easier it will be to process. In other languages, uh, such as English or French, for instance, a more prominent role, role is played by the load placed on, once again, work in memory. That is, processing difficulty is determined by the distance between constituents that go together in the syntax. So the longer this distance is, the harder the integration of new words in the partially passed structure will be. Moreover, long distances make it possible that intervening words uh, which uh, share morphological and semantic features with those that are supposed to go together, interfere with this process of integration. So it seems that typological features of languages predict whether expectation or memory play a larger role in sentence processing. So expectation uh, effect, um, ex mm, seems to affect uh, especially the processing of uh, languages in which verb final um, constructions are, um, uh, are possible and, and, and uh, highly frequent, and languages with high uh, morphological marking. Whereas memory effects show mo mm, most prominently in fixed word order languages. However, such mechanisms are not mutually exclusive as a study of sentence processing in Russian, for instance, uh, seems to indicate. So and quite crucially for our purposes, Russian is probably the most similar language to classical Greek from a topological point of view among those on which such theories have been tested. And we may reasonably argue that it is likely that native sentence processing difficulty in classical Greek would be predicted by expectation-based models, uh, as is the case in while well, other languages is freer word order, but we have to take into account a memory effect, uh, the effect of interference, uh, for instance. So now I don't think I have time to explain this in much more detail right now, uh, but perhaps we can discuss it later. And hopefully I will make clearer, uh, will make it clearer what I mean if we have a look at at some text. So uh, I will start by examining the metathesis of a sentence of Xenophon uh, from the Anabasis made by uh, Demetrius, and that's uh, number two on your handout. So uh, here Demetrius uh, maintains that the sentence is unclear because of plagiotes and promises to make its form clearer by rewriting it, rewriting it ex hoteias. So this expression, exoteus, should indicate that the obscure dependent constructions corresponding to the participles peripleusas and echonta are turned into clearer direct constructions, so clauses with a verb in the indicative. 
So now there is no evidence that non-finite verbs are intrinsically harder to understand that than finite verbs in any language, even though it is true, as we shall see, that the, they may be hotspots for difficult syntactic patterns. So Dimitris's impression, well, I would argue that it must be due to some other feature of Xenophon's sentence. So let us attempt a dynamic, word-by-word, -word, incremental passing of Xenophon's sentence. So first we encounter Kai and Hoti, and these, uh, so the conjunction clearly um, anticipates a verb. So this is not a complete utterance until a verb comes up. And so does uh, trieres. So the verb shows up, that's echoen, and satisfies his expectations. So since this verb um, so um, um, this verb is in the uh, third person singular. It reveals that trieres can't be its subject and is an accusative, which was ambiguous until, until now. So now, akuo can govern an accusative of the thing or event about, one thing's, uh, about, uh, one, um, about which one hears. And it would not be surprising if either a predicative participle or an infinitive should occur. Uh, later in the sentence, and these would specify the event in which the triremes are involved and which was heard of. So actually, a predicative participle does follow immediately, together with its adjuncts, so peripleusas, apionias, eiskilikian. And from a syntactic and a semantic point of view, this partially input sentence can be considered complete here, with the meaning and that he heard that triremes were sailing round from Ionia to Cilicia. However, tamon follows, which might be unexpected, and is left pending until ekonta is encountered. So this is, there's no room to integrate tamon in the partially uh, past structure, if we consider it complete at Kilikian. So uh, ekonta is the real governor of trieres peripleusas, and this is the participle that depends on echoen. So the meaning would be, he had heard that Tamus commanded triremes that were sailing round, etc. So it appears that the partial analysis of the sentence up to Kilikian was wrong, and that all that part of the sentence must be reanalyzed by the hearer or reader once the rest of the sentence is encountered. So this is a cognitively demanding task, and this is why one can argue Demetrius found this sentence difficult to process, um, especially as he read it rather than heard it. So prosody might have helped the uh, listener in um, while well predicting that the, sen the, 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 the sentence wasn't complete at uh, Ace Kilikian. So this might be, uh, well, one of the reasons why uh, Dionysius broke the sentence up in, in his metathesis and incidentally also replaced the participles peripleusas and ekonta with finite clauses. So let us move on to the second example. It's number three on your handout. So in, in, the, three, in the treatise on Thucydides, Dionysius rewrites a long sentence in order to show how Thucydides could have made it clearer and more pleasant. <laughs> To see, so let us see if and why Dionysius succeeded in his task. So from the point of view of understandability, so the content clarity and the way information is presented, uh, so chunks of content are presented, Dionysius eliminates the, the digression that ranges from kaiautoi tete opse to epi like daimonius, and moves its contents to the end, so ectetesopsios epi lecaidaimonius, and this is the part that is underlined in the parallel texts. And Dionysius points this out himself, so this, he says, this is what I'm doing, this is how I made this text clearer. But Dionysius' alter alterations, however, reach beyond this, and they also affect form clarity, I would argue. So if we start from the original text of Thucydides, we see that after the initial genitive absolute, uh, there's a long series of participles in the nominative uh, preceding the main verb. So these are printed in bold in the handout. So, elephotes and xunetis menoi uh, 
are coordinate to one another by means of te and chi, printed in bold italic. And this pair, uh, participles, is coordinate to gnontes by means of the previous chi. So the participle phenomenon instead is subordinate to elephotes. So I made a simple diagram showing this syntactic slash semantics dependencies um, among, uh, well, between uh, participles and groups uh, of participles. So it I would argue that it would not be easy to reconstruct this hierarchy if one passed the sentence one word at a time, as one does in listening or f uh, when reading a text for the first time. So the first chi may well raise the expectation for a participle coordinate to gnontes to occur at some point in the sentence. So the particle te, which follows shortly, does not show in an obvious way that it will eventually coordinate the expected participle, that will be elephotes, more than any other element of the participial clause to some other element to follow. So te, in principle, could have scope over teopse, for instance. Since caixinetis menoi immediately follows phenomenoi, chances are that it can be interpreted as coordinate to phenomenoi itself, which is unequivocally um, subordinate to elephotes. So Dionysius' metathesis makes all such relations explicit as he replaces phenomenoi with the finite uh, verb causal clause, hoti polaplasioi uh, esan. Furthermore, Thucydides uses autoi both as an anaphoric pronoun referring to the Lacedaemonians, so this is double underlined, so and, uh, I'm looking at autus bradyuterus et de ontas, then autus homoios sphisi finestai, and epautus in Thucydides' text. But he also uses autoi as a demonstrative pronoun referring to the uh, skirmishes, so oipsiloi autoi phenomenoi. Dionysius instead only uses autoi to refer to the Lacedaemonians, removing all potential ambiguities in the assignment of a referent to this uh, pronoun. Thucydides also embeds clauses with a finite verb in the third person plural, so hoti epepontesan, hosper hote apebainon, between the subject of the main verb, oipsiloi, and the main verb itself, hormesan. The subject of these verbs is the same as that of the main verb, and it is likely that the intervening verbs might have interfered with the processing of the main verb, as a memory-based account would predict. Actually, Dionysius turns this nested structure into a linear one, with, and all these center embedded clauses become final embedded. So, epeide, epepontesan, and hote, proton, apebainon. So, of course, Dionysius need not have been aware of this type of changes and need not have talked about them explicitly, but this, I would argue, makes them all the more significant in that they are even more likely to, to reflect what he empirically considered clearer than what he theorized to be clearer. So in the end, I hope to have shown how we might be able to go at least some way uh, towards reading an ancient critic's mind. Thank you very much for that introduction. Well, I'm going to be talking about something called opacity that I think ties in with Alessandro's obscurity. But it's not textual, but behavioral. So I'm going to uh, honor uh, Peter's request that we uh, say a little bit about the cognitive theory that we're using here. So I want to start off by discussing research on imitation and over-imitation, and then just very briefly touch on the idea that Roman children learned their rituals, and adults for that matter, through imitating exempla. And then I'm going to point to some places where I see over-imitation at work in Roman ritual. And then I'm going to make two suggestions, and I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion for psychologists uh, that, I, that is inspired by the sort of ethnographic data uh, of, uh, from ancient Rome, and that's a proposal uh, that unites two competing accounts of over-imitation that we find in the 
literature. And then I'm going to make a suggestion for classicists, and that's I'm going to suggest that over imitation, this cognitive behavioral universal that psychologists have identified, I'm going to suggest that it explains or gives us new grip on three features of Roman ritual. Um, and so all of this is going to be done briefly and uh, I hope just suggestively. Um, and we can come back and discuss some of these slides and some of what I've said in the Q&A. So let me just start off by setting up imitation for us. What, imitation has been found by psychologists, dev developmental psychologists, to be extremely flexible. It's part of a child's uh, epistemic toolbox, part of the way they learn about the world around them, including the cultural world and the social world. But it's also just social imitation allows us to affiliate with others. One crucial thing about imitation is it's not just mimicry. It, it, it involves understanding that other people have intentions when they act and that they have goals toward which they're acting, that their actions are teleological. Now, there's a kind of, there's a, a, a subcategory of imitation that's been observed in infants that has been called rational imitation. And that's where even 14-month-old babies can observe what a, a, an adult does and they can go then achieve the same effect in the world but, by, uh, but omitting what they perceive to be causally irrelevant actions. Um, also, babies are good at, if you make a mistake when you're doing a behavior, the babies recognize that and filter it out and they'll imitate what you were trying to do, not the mistake you made. So they see, that, they see what your intention and your goal was. Um, and, and in fact, even when an adult's actions fail, babies can infer what you were attempting and they can then imitate and succeed where you failed. Now, but there's something that's uh, aroused a lot of controversy in imitation research and that's this extremely high fidelity kind of imitation called over imitation. And the thinking is that over imitation is critical for cultural transmission. For example, our closest kin, uh, the apes, don't over imitate. And we'll get into why this is important for cultural transmission. But it's sort of the flip side of rational imitation. There are times when babies will will precisely imitate even causally arbitrary or opaque actions, actions whose causal means-ends relation is, is unclear. Um, and in fact, when children get older and you can talk to them about what they're doing, they can even, they'll over-imitate even though they will say that they know that, these, that certain actions are causally irrelevant to achieving a certain effect. Now, there's two competing accounts of why this is. One account is that this is uh, part of children's physical causal learning, that they're learning about the physical world, uh, they're learning physics, basically, and they're just imitating every action because they don't know which of your actions are the ones that are uh, physically efficacious. Now, a competing account is that what we see here is not learning about physical causality, but learning about norms that children and adults are interpreting others' actions as normative, as conventional, as, as part of how we have to do it, how we should do it, and that's why they over-imitate. Okay, so like I said, over-imitation is seen to be critical to cultural transmission because culture involves specialized, causally opaque behaviors that we have to master, and we have to master them accurately. On the causal account, we over-imitate because it helps us learn causally opaque instrumental behaviors like how to make a tool that you can then use to make another tool. That's, there's a whole causal chain there, physical causality, that's very difficult to just intuit. You have to over-imitate until you get it. The normative account holds that we over-imitate because it helps us learn conventional behaviors such as games and rituals. Now, I'm going to try to unite these two accounts. Um, it's worth noting that children over-imitate actions they've seen, a th they've seen third, party, uh, third parties do. In other words, it's not just things they've been taught. 
Also, overimitation increases with age into adulthood. We all do it, and it seems to occur with variations across cultures. Now we can come back to this. Um, but just to give you a quick example of uh, overimitation, a 1988 experiment by Andrew Meltzoff. He had uh, 14-month-old infants observe an adult turn on a light by pushing on this button with the head. The, uh, the child was not allowed to interact with the object. The child was brought back a week later and presented with the object. What did the child do? The child turned on the box with its head. This is deferred and high fidelity imitation, right? Could have used his hands, his or her hands. Now, so Derek Lyons has proposed that, um, that what's going on here, and we can come back to this slide. There's more information than we can go through, but I do want to show you a little video he recorded. He proposed that the baby is turning on the light box with its head because the baby has encoded this evidently purposeful action uh, that was causally opaque. The baby didn't understand why the adult did it this way, but the baby understood that the adult intended to do it this way, and the baby thought to itself, well, this must be part of the causal structure of this activity. This must be how you have to do it causally. And let me just then show you this. You'll see over imitation uh, in effect here. Let's see if I can get it to go. There we go. Causally unnecessary or opaque actions. There it is. Leaves the room. So the idea is that this poor child has encoded all these actions as part of the causality of retrieving this little toy. Um, now there's a normativity approach to this too, to explain the same thing, and we can come back to this slide again. There's more to talk. Uh, there's more here than we can talk about, but. Uh, right now, but basically the normativity account is simply not that the child is, is some sort of, uh, is, is clueless about the mechanics of, of how you open a little door and pull out a little toy. It's that the, the child assumed that you were doing something that was a conventional, ritualized sort of activity, and this is just how we do it. And I'll, you know, I'll be darned if I'm not going to learn how we do it, you know, so I'm going to do it just like the adult did. So the child <clears throat> encodes the actions as normatively necessary. Okay, now I'm just going to take this as read. Um, obviously, the Romans uh, were big on imitation. Quintilian tells us imitation is characteristic of a teachable nature. He also says that a great deal of ours is, consists in imitation. It's, it's how cultural transmission takes place. And of course, you can see cases turning now to the specific case of religious ritual. And again, I won't belabor this. I'll just take it as understood. Uh, in the Roman world, children learned ritual by imitating adults, right? Accompanying them, seeing them do ritual, um, and uh, imitating. So the cult tradition that uh, results from this informal imitation-based mode of pedagogy pedagogy is over-imitative, or in the more familiar term, orthoprax, right? Roman orthopraxy, of course, has been endlessly remarked upon, and I've put some quotations on your handout. Um, Clifford Ando, uh, um, notably, uh, has 
opined that Roman orthopraxy results from a Roman sort of empirical stance toward ritual. Romans carefully noted what worked. This, we're at sections five on your handout, section five. They noted carefully what worked, what was causally effective in ritual practice, and they imitated it. They replicated it. And um, now in magic, we can see, now let's look at an example here. Now, in magic, we see words and gestures that are undoubtedly causally efficacious, no matter how causally opaque they are. And I'm, I want to direct your attention to an example from Cato at 5C on your handout. Cato says that if you dislocate a limb, you can heal it by performing a series of gestures with a reed that has been split down the middle and pressed to your hips while chanting, Motas vaita daries dardares astatares disunapiter. Now the causal opacity of these vocalizations and gestures is almost perfect, right? What could any of these things contribute to the physical effect of fixing a dislocated limb? Because the causal relationship between this ritual and its effect is so difficult to infer, the entire ritual must be over-imitated in the sense of over-imitation used by lions, where it's causal uh, over-imitation, where you're encoding actions as instrumentally necessary, although in some non-transparent way, to obtaining an effect in the real world. So I would say that's one way you could look at magic, is a, it's a causally opaque system of, of ri uh, rituals and gestures. Now, if we turn to a second example, 5D number uh, 1I on your handout, Pliny tells us a story about how Numa used to call down lightning, quote, by means of certain rites and prayers. Now, Numa's successor, Tullius Hostilius, attempted the same ritual, but did not imitate the ritual accurately enough, imitatum parum rite and so was struck by lightning. So causally opaque actions designed to produce an effect in the physical world had failed due to lack of imitative fidelity. Now, as Pliny tells it, this story does seem to relate strictly to a ritual for causing a physical effect, just like Cato's magic spell, right? But let's go to Livy, and this is 5D, uh, second entry on your handout, who also tells us Frugi's story. And we see that Livy, unlike Pliny, preserves the reason for the ritual's failure. He said the prawa religio, the improper ritual, had excited Jupiter's anger, and he signaled his wrath by striking Tullius Hostilius with lightning. Now, what does... What does th this Livian version add to our understanding of causal opacity and over-imitation? Well, it provides support for the normative approach uh, to over-imitation. In effect, in Livy's version, Jupiter protests a breach of orthoprax ritual norms by smiting the king. So this is not reducible to a case of causing an unintended physical effect. But does this mean that we have to throw out the causal uh, account of over-imitation? Over Not at all. Instead, this example shows that we can unite the causal and the normative accounts. That is, it is precisely by adhering to certain norms, in this case norms of ritual, that one causes certain effects. But these effects are not in the first place physical, but rather psychological. A normatively proper ritual would not have affected the physical domain and produced lightning by magic. Rather, a normatively proper ritual would have affected Jupiter's mind appropriately, eliciting lightning from him. So the normative is causal, but the effects of proper norm following are psychological effects, not physical effects. Norms, even causally opaque norms, have real effects, but these effects are psychological, realized in the minds of others, in this case, gods who are responsive to these norms. Now, we can explore this uh, a little bit further by looking at uh, 
the distinctively Roman case of instauratio at number 5E on your handout. Livy has uh, Camillus neatly summarized this institution. Instauratio is the repetition from scratch of a ritual or ceremony, quote, because something from the ancestral rite has been omitted due to negligence or chance. And Cicero dilates on this at length, also on your handout, um, when he talks about how some games have been desecrated because something has been omitted or done wrong. Uh, I'm not going to read through the whole um, passage, but that these sacra have to be celebrated anew from the beginning in Staurata. And Cicero lists in detail some of the deceptively minor infractions that could cause games or, or rituals to need to be repeated. If a dancer has stopped, if a flute player suddenly falls silent, if a boy has let go of the reins of a chariot. In such cases, the games have been incorrectly performed, non rite facti. Now, Cicero gives the rationale behind instauratio, this repetition from scratch of a ritual, it's that the it's that instauratio appeases the minds of the gods. Now, instauratio must represent a very extreme cultural deployment of over-imitation. It's not enough to do the rites exactly right. You must also start all over again if you make the slightest error. And so here we see the practical antidote to the to Frugi's cautionary tale about Tullius Hostilius, incorrect ritual, prawa religio, excites divine anger. Luckily, instauratio, correct reperformance, can turn aside that anger and appease the mentes deorum, as Cicero tells us. So again, psychological causation, right? Now Let's think about the divine mind just for one second. Um, if, these, if the rituals by which we appease the divine mind are causally opaque and must be over-imitated scrupulously, it's also true that the divine minds to whom the rituals are addressed are psychologically opaque. Now, note that the transparency of the human mind was a commonplace in antiquity. I've got some uh, quotations that show that, the number six on your handout. The idea is simply that the human face, the wultus, represents a kind of silent, natural speech of the mind that discloses the contents of the mind to others with relative clarity. Our faces are psychologically transparent to others. Uh, and theirs are to us. But the divine mind is comparatively psychologically o opaque. We have no access to a divine wultus on which to read the divine mind. All we have is ritual, which is like a language. But as Cicero points out um, on the slide here and on your handout, language is opaque to the minds of those not united by the sokietas of the same linguistic norms. Unless we share a given set of linguistic norms with another agent, that agent's language cannot move or affect us. So where the gods are concerned, all we have is the opaque language of ritual, a system of norms for producing effects in and reading the state of the divine mind. We indicate our will in prayer and cult to the gods, and the gods indicate their will through the entrails of victims or by means of prodigies and auspicia. And this itself is a language, the language of prodigies and auspicia, a language we have to master through over-imitation. And so this is why we have to keep our ritual communications crystal clear and free of ambiguities, why we have to start over again if we mess up the grammar of a ritual sentence, as it were. So this is why we have the cautionary tale of Atelius Hostilius, who in inadvertently incited the divine mind to anger by breaching ritual norms. And this is why we have the institution of instauratio, which allows us to repair these breaches. Now, to summarize the argument uh, thus far quite baldly, uh, 
In order to reliably, uh, in order reliably to exert causality in the do- domain of divine psychology, Romans had to over-imitate in ritual performance. Only meticulous adherence to normatively determined action sequences could ensure achievement of the desired effects in the divine mind. Only over-imitation of causally opaque ritual actions could ensure the desired psychological uh, effect in the God. Now, this summary puts me in a position to just reiterate my... um, Uh, suggestion for psychologists, and it's up here on the screen too, that is that we should view over-imitation as at once normative and causal. In over-imitation, we see a convergence of normative and causal factors, and hence of normative and causal motives on the part of over-imitators. In the social world, especially a social world that includes gods, the normative aspects of actions are instrumental to their causality, their psychological causality. As Roman Roman ritual shows, getting the norms of ritual right causes divine pleasure, while getting the norms wrong causes divine displeasure, getting struck with lightning. And this psychological causality is very real and every bit as consequential as any physical causality involved in moving objects around. So now I'm, I can also just state and s- sum up my proposal uh, for classicists, and it's simply this. If Roman orthoprax ritual is a system of causally opaque conventional actions, um, then its very opacity, its causal opacity, will have triggered an over-imitation response in Roman culture learners, not only children but also adults, Over-imitation in response to the causal opacity of Roman ritual ensured high-fidelity copying of the ritual and hence high-fidelity cultural transmission. Roman ritual, with its cautionary tales about imperfect imitation and its remedy for under-imitation in Stauratio, is a paradigm and an indeed extreme case of causally opaque cultural knowledge transmitted by over-imitation. Now I want to add just two, uh, so the basic idea is that the causal opacity of Roman ritual triggered an over-imitation response in culture learners. I have two further sort of uh, explanations that I think an over-imitation perspective allows us to uh, uh, see, and I'll just state them quickly and then be done. One is that I think this over-imitation perspective allows us to explain multiple etiologies. Um, since these causally opaque actions of ritual lack any kind of authoritative explanation of their causal properties, multiple uh, etiologies uh, arise in a spontaneous uh, search for, to, to make these actions causally transparent. We try to explain, why did you do it that way? So. In the lack of orthodoxy, you get uh, multiple etiology, polydoxy. I think over-imitation also can help us explain ritual change in the Roman ritual paradoxically. Because over-imitation preserves opaque ritual technologies, but in preserving those technologies, it creates a zone of latent ritual solutions to new religious problems that might arise. So it preserves these ritual tech, over-imitation preserves these technologies to be built upon and innovated upon so that each generation is not reinventing the wheel. They're in fact building on an edifice that's reliably being preserved by over-imitation. Well, I'll stop there, but um, if there's any uh, slides you want to go back to, anything you want to talk about, uh, Please, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks to uh, Peter for organizi- organizing this uh, event and for the opportunity to come back uh, to NYU again. That's at least the second talk I've given in this uh, room. <laughs>
Um, in response also to his suggestion that we foreground our theoretical stances, I'm just going to say a couple of words. Uh, I'm making a move that's a little unusual for me, though actually pretty common in the field as a whole. I'm going to look at some ancient texts that are broadly speaking about cognition themselves, in this case memory, and use contemporary research in that area as a comparandum for the interpretation of those texts. Some of the modern research I'll cite is fairly empirical, but my general posture will be aligned with notions of extended embodied cognition. As the title says, I'll be talking today, third person, about the system called artificial memory described at some length by Quintilian, Cicero, and the uh, anonymous Auctor Ad Herenium. For those of you who weren't here this morning and don't know this text already, I'll give you a quick refresher. Uh, and for reasons of time, I'll generally gloss over the fairly modest differences between the sources, both right now and later in the paper. The ostensible object of the system is to enable a speaker to memorize, at least in outline, extended compositions of the sort ancient orators were expected to deliver. The first step was to fix in one's mind a grid of spaces, Loki, in the form of some real-world se sequence of architectural places. Then, before each individual performance, the speaker would populate that grid with images, imagines, that could remind him of the various elements of the speech. Finally, in performance, the speaker read off the imagines in the order provided by the Loki. This system has proven extremely attractive both to classical scholars, especially art historians, and to students of its later medieval and Renaissance descendants. In fact, it's been the catalyst from some really uh, landmark pieces of scholarship, such as Yeats's The Art of Memory, or Bergman's classic article on the House of the Tragic Poet. I'm not gonna talk about the big picture contributions of those works, on which I wouldn't improve in any case. Instead, I wanna go back to their shared origin in the method of artificial memory and argue in essence that they have misread these texts by attributing some of their own best ideas to the classical writers. The argument falls into two halves. The first, mostly philological half, argues that artificial memory is a much more rigid system than it's often claimed. The second half deploys some relatively recent cognitive findings to suggest what kind of aid it was and why it's well designed for the specific task that was at hand. So the first part. Mary Carruthers wrote that the Roman memory theorists, quote, conceive of memory not only as rote, the ability to reproduce something, whether a text, a formula, a list of items, an incident, but as the matrix of a reminiscing uh, cog cogitation, shuffling and collating things stored in a random access memory scheme or set of schemes, a memory architecture in a library with the express intention that it be used inventively. Seen this way, artificial memory is not merely storage, but a generative device. It works by putting the various contents of the memory together in multiple and suggestive patterns. Carruthers is a medievalist, and I, I gather emerita here at NYU, and was concerned more with later and different systems. I pick that passage out, though, because it's quoted approvingly by the most recent classical discussion I know, Elsner and Squire's chapter on sight and memory, which is itself an account of artificial memory and its application to the broader visual culture. Indeed, Elsner and Squire go on to demonstrate the power of this random access approach by an exemplary reading of two Pompeian houses. They point to rooms and even suites where multiple walls are centered around variations on a reclining nude youth theme and speculate on the various ways viewers might have compared and contrasted the different treatments of the theme as they encountered them and even how they might have projected those meetings back onto the spaces that housed the images. It's a successful strategy, if perhaps not wildly different from the one already developed in the Bergman article I mentioned a minute ago. But as compelling as these arguments are in explaining their real objects of interest, whole families of memory systems and discourses for Yeats and for Carruthers, paintings for Bergman, for Elsner and Squire, and for Paschal, the approach seems problematic in at least three overlapping ways when projected back onto artificial memory. As with the ancient sources, time will require that I lump all these scholars together as modern scholarship, typically just quoting Elsner and Squire as the most recent case. And I don't include in this set the very different contribution of small, 
to which I'll return in the second half. So first problem. These modern readings of houses ignore serial order. As Elsner and Squire say, speaking of one of the specific cases of their houses, crucially, quote, crucially all these spaces containing similar images are accessible from the main peristyle at the house's center. As such, the formal resemblances between the panels weave a nexus of possible interconnections. Yet the point of the whole artificial memory enterprise is precisely the imposition of linear order, ordo. Cicero, for instance, uses the key term four times, including the observation that it is, quote, the order of Locke that preserves the order of the topics, and similarly for Quintilian. While the odd herenium does allow for limited options in reading the images memorized, you can start at any point and move in either direction, both options are premised on the existence, at least, of a fixed linear order. There are only two directions you can go from any point. For failure of order, the text says explicitly, means failure of memory. For the inattentive reader, that phrase, in order, is also helpfully repeated four times. I, I should say in passing here, the modern authorities I cite are all extremely clear on this reading when they're talking about the theoretical texts. But when they turn to practice, they appear either to ignore it or to slide over into reading ordo as something like disposition in general rather than the linear order that's clearly in question. Second problem. Uh, ignoring order is important to the modern readings because what they really want to talk about is interaction of imagines. As for instance, Elsner and Squire, quote, Though their through their iconographic and formal resonances, the paintings invited viewers, whether consciously or unconsciously, to draw out associations both within and between the parallel dining spaces. In fact, in the ancient sources, not only do the Locke order the imagines, they separate them from each other as well. When the authors list criteria for what makes a good imago, they're all context insensitive. So for instance, Cicero wants something that is agens, acer, and insignitus. Operating with blinders this way is particularly striking for Quintilian, one of whose major themes is adjustment to local circumstance. And where examples are given, the concrete ones are in practice context insensitive as well, whether that's Quintilian's simple an anchor standing in for sailing, <coughs> or the odd herenium's rather more Baroque combination of, quote, Domitius raising his hands to heaven while he's whipped by the Marquee Reges in one locus, followed by, quote, a sopus and Kimber fitted out as Agamemnon and Menelaus in the Iphigenia in the following locus. The limited flexibility that the ad herenium finds within linear order also runs against a contextual reading of any of the individual signs. If we were reading signs one against each other, the order would matter. But if they're quarantined from each other by their Locke, it makes sense that we can look both ways. And Quintilian, who's more skeptical of the whole enterprise than the other two, admits artificial memory might help with a pure list. His example is buyers at an auction but doubts its value for something like a speech in which transitions are crucial. That is to say, the system is potentially too isolating even for its own good. Now, there would certainly have been a creative element in the delivery of a speech that had been memorized in this fashion, principally in the interpretation of individual imagines, but perhaps also in the possibility of going off script. But the basic function of this system is not generative in the way discussed above. It's neither random access nor comparative. If we're going to say that it facilitates creativity, as Elsner and Squire do, it's only to the extent that it disciplines creativity. Or rather, it offers a safety net, allowing the speaker to fall back on the original plan after some burst of imagination. Third problem. Modern interpretations tend to collapse the locus imago distinction. Both are lumped together as visual stimuli, so that, quote, the doubling of image and background in relation to a visual flow that enables a painting to be both part of its background and symbolic of something else. More generally, that same idea is implicit in the widespread translation of locus as background, despite the salutary warning of small. But the difference is a matter of kind, the difference in the actual theory is a matter of kind, not just degree of prominence. I'll have reason to talk about the very different language used to describe both types in a couple of minutes. 
but their respective ideal forms are also different. In Cicero's version, quoted verbatim and approvingly by Quintilian, there are separate and entirely disjoint lists of properties of the good locus and the good imago. The clearest evidence, however, for radical separation of Locke and Imagines comes from two other related observations. The first is practical. The Locke are meant to be reused to memorize multiple texts. As the Adherenium says, it will be necessary to think carefully about the Locke which we've taken up so they will stick in our memory forever. For the images, like letters inscribed on a tablet, are deleted when no longer in use, but the places, like the wax of a tablet, must remain behind. And Cicero quotes the claims of two Greek memory experts to, quote, set down those things which they wish to remember <coughs> uh, as if writing with letters in wax in the places which they already had. This means that any given set of Locke can be used to record unrelated or even opposite messages, and that Locke can exist without imagination. Uh, altogether. Uh, in real spaces, presumably, there are not principal distinctions between decor, design, and architecture, but in the imaginary spaces, there's a rigorous separation. Second, and more literarily, there's the double metaphor that I just quoted. Locke are to wax tablets or papyrus as imagines are to the writing thereon. One of these comparisons, or the pair, appear an astonishing five times in the three fairly short uh, passages. Note the stark, stark ontological difference between the two categories. Locke and Imagines are not just different things, but different kinds of things. Not apples and oranges, but apples and topographic patterns. Now, I've treated the imago locus distinction at length, not because it's the most important point in the existing literature, though it's relevant to a detailed critique, but because it leads into the second, more positive half of my argument, and this is where we also turn to the modern science of memory. If the same piece of paper <coughs> can hold a treatise or love letter, blessing or curse, it doesn't carry the meaning in any more ordinary sense. It's the images, the letters that are read. Yet the medium is indispensable not just in practice, but as something the theorists feel a need to remind us of repeatedly and theorize at length. So what's it doing for them? <clears throat> I want to take seriously and literally the theory's own claim that the text and support, the Imagines and Locke, have quite separate functions. The Imagines supply only the semantic context of the speech, and the Locke provide only a structure and that structure is narrowly defined by the linear order I've already discussed. Now, as I said, nobody's missed this at the theoretical level, but somehow modern scholars find it hard to take on in practice. I suspect this is because they deprecate what Carruthers described in the earlier quotations as rote learning. Modern readers want to find something more worthily complex than memorizing a mere list, and even small, with whom I share a great deal, does not get quite to the heart of the problem that I'm about to paint, um, and so doesn't see artificial memory as a sufficiently distinctive solution. Extensive linear memorization is not mere anything. It's in fact a cognitively unnatural and therefore difficult task. Ramifying networks of association, as for instance in creative response to individual magones, is a much more natural process. Ronald Gira offers the following observation drawn from work comparing human brains and artificial neural networks. What such networks do best is recognize and complete patterns in input provided by the environment. But if something like this, that is to say holistic pattern matching, is correct, we face a big problem. How do humans do the kind of apparently linear symbol processing required for such fundamental cognitive activities as using language and doing mathematics? One important answer, he argues, is to offload <coughs> linear aspects of processing to various kinds of external representations, particularly diagrams. I've written about that option elsewhere in, in classical contexts, but it's forbidden in this case by the social protocols of Roman public speaking. You can't show up with notes. <coughs> Instead, I want to appeal to a broader category of which diagrams are a particular case. And that's what's been called scaffolding. 
By that term, I just mean the wide array of resources, physical objects, social practices, one's own body, which are used to assist or even constitute cognition. And I'm going to duck the philosophical question. Uh, one of the mechanisms by which scaffolds operate is to reshape tasks so that they're more easily handled by some mental faculty that would not otherwise be applicable. For instance, various kinds of geometrical problems are much more easily solved by visual inspection of a diagram or by physical manipulation of models than by introspection. To see the relevance of this to the present problem, I want to start from the very different role the visual plays in the functioning of the Locke and Imagenes. And Small has some important remarks here on this point, but again, I think does not go far enough. While Imagenes should be dramatic and are typically removed from daily experience, Locke should be and typically are literally day to day. Locke should have only enough features themselves to, one, avoid being confused one with another, and note that Locke are compared to each other in a way Imagenes aren't, and two, they have to avoid interference with seeing the Imagenes that they contain. Moreover, the governing metaphors for the two systems are different. Interaction with Imagenes is visual, aspectus, videre, intueri. Interaction with Locke is kinetic, per Percurere or cursus, corcum ire, uh, ad moeris, uh, other vocabulary. That is to say, while there's a visual element in the identification of individual Locke, their collective structure, which is their reason for being, is a matter of space and motion. This, as it turns out, perhaps should not be surprising. Recent research on blind persons has shown that they do better on a variety of serial memorization tasks than sighted persons. That is, not only is linear memorization not specifically visual, but visual information can interfere with it. In a more positive sense, it's been hypothesized by a number of different researchers doing different experiments that the basic spatial mechanism underlying this is one of chaining. That is, not just learning an order, but by connecting specific pairwise, uh, constructing specific pairwise links between items. And in fact, that's precisely what Quintilian says is going on in artificial memory. Quote, thus however many things have to be memorized, the individual items come to be interwoven like a chorus, apparently hand in hand, and since they link succeeding items to preceding ones, the only burden is in the initial labor of learning them. And here I think it becomes significant that the spaces that you have to memorize, the Locke, are meant to be near to one another. If the system was based on visual distinctiveness, then the seven wonders of the world would be great. But in fact, we have a system dependent on pairwise connectedness. Now, Elsner and Squire are surely right about what they described as the ocular-centric bent <coughs> of Roman culture as a general matter. But there are limits to what can be implemented in the Roman brain. Spatial reasoning handles order relatively well, so linear memorization benefits from spatialization. Hence the creation of Locke, and then they're used to separate the signs. Seen this way, incidentally, the sequestering of signs I described earlier is a feature, not a bug. <coughs> if the signs don't interact with one another, they don't interfere with one another and disrupt the hard work order. Beyond the spatial, a second cognitive function may also be brought into play, the motor system. Note that the memorized spaces are walkable. We can see that both from their identity, a street, a house, a colonnade, a series of archways, and from the kinetic language I cited above. Moreover, they're likely, in fact, to have been walked. For the outdoor ad herenium, Locke are normally taken from experience and fabricated only when that doesn't happen to work. For Quintilian, Locke can be either sumpti from real life or ficti, but imagines are necessarily figendi made up. Now, the experimental evidence I'm aware of here is not precisely on point, but there's some suggestive results. We know that the mere fact of gesture can enhance cognition in a variety of contexts, like people who have to walk to give a talk. Um, it's a very general phenomenon, but it's especially true of spatial processing. Nor is it always just a side effect of expressive gesture. It can take place in any form and in physical isolation. More specifically, real gesture has been shown to produce mental motion through a virtual linear order. 
That is to say, experimental subjects' physical gestures to right and left affected their subjective position on an imagined number line, very much like the virtual construct of artificial memory. What I want to suggest then is that the arrangement of artificial memory could additionally harness the bodily motion of a speaker who is, after all, on his feet walking around. Now, I'm not suggesting that the speaker would mime the topics of the speech in parallel with the homogenes. Rather, a very simple movement, a physical step or two forward, such as would have been executed at will, could have helped the speaker move mentally from location to location and thus cue up each successive uh, topic. In summary then, the artificial memory texts describe a very specific practice with a very narrow goal. Though not particularly sexy, linear memorization is an important and difficult task. The method of Locke and Imogenes is a cognitively plausible response to that task, particularly in its recruitment of a spectrum of cognitive activities, some of them not strictly neural. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I was, uh, not too, too long ago, a lonely humanist at Stuyvesant, which is a math science high school just down the road. So it's a, a pleasure to be back nearby talking about uh, cognitive theory and the classics. So uh, what I am going to talk about today is just give an overview of a forthcoming book of mine, On the Care of Souls. And, late antique monasticism, looking especially at cognition and discipline. So I will outline in particular how cognitive theory is related to my arguments there. But first, because this is probably far afield for almost everybody in the room, a few quick words about what monasticism is. So while we get asceticism, that is things like chastity, fasting, vigils, from the early period in Christianity, it's the fourth century when we have Antony, who strikes off into the desert, renounces everything. Uh, it's this kind of uh, dramatic symbolism of a break with society that is the prelude to a kind of totalizing personal reformation. So Antony is a hermit, but then we get a development called koinobitic, or group monasticism, where we have a number of people living together under the control of an abbot and his uh, first men, as they're called. Pacomius is the major uh, innovator in that regard, and he had a network of monasteries called the Koinonia. So this develops in Egypt, uh, a rich a variety of literature in Greek and Coptic, and it quickly gets parceled out across the Mediterranean world. So writings in Greek include Basil of Caesarea's long and short rules and translations uh, into Latin by Jerome and others. This will give you just a quick idea of some of the earliest foundations. The material that I work with mostly is the Koinobitic material, which is primarily in the south, so Tavanese is Pacomius's earliest foundation. And then up north, there's another famous character um, uh, called, uh, well, the, the White Monastery of Sohag, which is another of these early Koinobitic Egyptian communities, and in particular, their famous abbot, Shanuta of Atripe, who has left us a massive, massive documentary corpus on what it was like to train monks in these institutional environments. Uh, nine canons, where he uh, has a very loud, mean-spirited, I would argue, prophetic voice, in which he kind of belligerently tries to get his disciples to think properly. So he's among the people whose works I read for this. Uh, and just a side note for you classicists, that uh, as the Coptic corpus is only now being edited for the first time because it's strewn about libraries all across Europe and North America. So this is a fragment uh, from Yale's Beinecke Library. What do I mean by the monastic care of souls? Well, if you join a monastery, a Koinobitic monastery, the leaders, you renounce all of your physical belongings, at least theoretically. The leaders are obligated to care for your physical necessities, room and board, uh, health care and burial, as well as what they call spiritual development, the care of souls. Disciples, in turn, have to be 
completely obedient, doing whatever work assignments they're given, but also reveal their emotions and thoughts to the teacher, to the abbot and his first men. So I argue in my book that the care of souls in early Christian monasticism is best understood as sort of an intensive form of socialization in which disciples acquire a new theory of mind, a monastic theory of mind. So this is an important cognitive concept that I'm going to talk a lot about. So theory of mind is, uh, in cognitive science, defined as the cognitive capacity to attribute mental states to self and others, and mental states include a variety of things, perceptions, feelings, emotional states, propositional attitudes of various kinds. The classical statement of theory of mind actually comes in developmental psychology. So there's a famous experiment where uh, the puppet Maxi with children is, uh, leaves a room and the psychologist hides the chocolate and Maxi comes back and the kids who are observing all this ask, where does Maxi think the chocolate is? So somewhere between three and four, uh, the kid will realize that because Maxi has left the room, in their mind, they think the chocolate is in the wrong place. So uh, they, will, they, will point to, uh, uh, they will point to the, uh, uh, the original place rather than the place the chocolate was moved to. So this is an ability to attribute uh, a, a kind of uh, state of knowledge to another person. So theory of mind has recently been expanded quite broadly by cognitive anthropologists, uh, of whom Tanya Lerman is a leader in the field, and she and others have a recent important work on this. So she says, there is no doubt that humans in all known cultures learn to infer intention and knowledge from the behavior of other humans. Yet at the same time, ethnographers observe that the inferences they draw are notably shaped not only by developmental capacity, but by cultural specificity. Now, uh, in general, uh, I'm coming from partially from a field in religious studies where cognitive science, there's a group of people who call themselves cognitive science of scientists of religion, and uh, they have proposed something called cognitive historiography, which is kind of a universalist evolutionary take on understanding broad-scale historical developments. And I would argue for uh, taking this anthropological approach to ancient history and practice something more on the lines of cognitive historicism, so learning from the new historicism and its approach to cultural specificity. Uh, this is a famous work by Lerman, uh, Cognitive Anthropology, when God talks back, understanding the American evangelical relationship with mind. Uh, and she does a lot of field work and also psychological experiments on what she calls inner sense cultivation, which has a lot to do with what I'll call cognitive disciplines in my own work. So uh, Lerman and others talk about six dimensions of mind that uh, vary cross-culturally, but all have to do with what the theory of mind is. So she, uh, the question, is the mind bounded or porous? Are interior thoughts and emotions significant and powerful? Do they have real meaning, or should we really not care about what's going on in our minds? Uh, the epistemic stance, that is imagination, a privileged path to reality, or a transient figment. Sensorial waiting. That is what particular senses are given weight in the culture, for example, the emphasis on sight in the modern West. And then finally, relational access. Who has access to the thoughts of others and how? That particular last one is a very big thing in monasticism. So uh, Lerman and her colleagues postulate six different uh, cultural models of the theory of mind. I won't go into them in detail. It's a typology based on modern work and one which uh, they invite further expansion on. Uh, what I have done is lay out some of the groundwork for a monastic theory of mind along the lines of the, the six elements that they were posited. So mind is permeable, that is uh, evil thoughts can be internal, your own, you own them, but they also can be uh, driven by external or demonic forces. Furthermore, bad thoughts are highly significant. If you allow yourself to entertain a bad thought and don't immediately reject it, then this is sinful and could cause you eternal damnation. According to Shanuta, uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot to end up in eternal hellfire. And he always, again and again, 
gets back to this point, which is another thing I will uh, talk about later. So you also must train your imaginative capacities to cope with bad thoughts. So you have to imagine yourself naked in front of the divine tribunal, but naked in multiple senses. So people can actually see your own inner thoughts, and you will be judged for them, even if you don't act on them, and uh, suffer eternal punishment. So these sorts of imaginative practices help one reject bad thoughts. So also we have uh, audition and vision, our key senses, uh, listening to scripture and other things go along with vision as important points in the monastic theory of mind. And then finally, uh, one's inner thoughts, if you're having a bad thought, then Pacomius or Shenouda knows about it, okay? So you have to, uh, they're making a list and uh, God is checking it twice. So you have to uh, be aware of that when you join a monastery. This is just uh, a picture from uh, the Vitae Patrum, uh, uh, late medieval of uh, Pacomius sort of dealing with these external demonic thoughts. So uh, how do monks learn this new monastic theory of mind? Well, in general, uh, monastic paideia, I think to an extent which is unprecedented in the classical world, deals with metacognition. So metacognition uh, means one's knowledge concerning one's own cognitive processes and the outcomes and anything related to them such as salvation or damnation. So uh, in contrast to the classical rhetorical idea of uh, one's words corresponding to one's actions, you get this trifecta in early Christian literature of attending to one's words, deeds, and also thoughts. Uh, in another dialogue, monks uh, talk about how they keep watch over their minds, and philosophers say, oh, that's something we don't do. Now, obviously, this is triumphalist rhetoric, but I think if it's not unique, the monastic attention to thoughts is certainly uh, uh, different and unprecedented. Or if it's not unprecedented, it's certainly different and unique. So uh, the metacognition is practice in the revelation of thoughts. Disciples must reveal everything uh, that's potentially sinful on their mind to a superior who then helps them deal with it through counseling, uh, and also emotional support through prayer. And in general, uh, Foucault, in his fourth volume of the History of Sexuality, uh, which wasn't published, but there are, you know, the, it's out uh, what exactly he was talking about uh, through various ways. He talks about monastic confession as a prelude to Freudian psychoanalysis, really. Uh, but my work suggests that this sort of confession is more like cognitive behavioral therapy today. So. Uh, you learn how to uh, slow down your cognitive stream, identify bad thoughts, and deal with them through what I call cognitive discipline. So cognitive disciplines are embodied practices to develop the mental, emotional, and imaginative capacities of monks, and ultimately they lead to, uh, or are supposed to lead to, a virtuous mind, understood from the monastic theory of mind. So what are they? I identify three primary cognitive disciplines, so one are scriptural practices, uh, audition, inscription, memorization, recitation, and meditation upon biblical verses, uh, and a more advanced, once you know everything, there's something called anti-reticle practice, so you get a bad thought, and based on what that bad thought is, there's a particular scriptural verse that you can use to respond to it. So almost the idea is you're replacing your own personal train of thought with biblical thoughts. Uh, fear of God, uh, I've already mentioned, uh, imagining post-mortem punishment, uh, and the idea especially that your hidden sins and thoughts will be observed and punished. And this is sort of reinforced by uh, what is called as cardionosticism. So the uh, monastic leaders like Pacomius will literally call out monks, say, I see what you're thinking right now, it's that, and then the monk uh, Repents, And then finally, the last and most advanced of this is prayer. So prayer uh, in the monastic setting is a combined physical and mental exertion, which is intended to cultivate a sense of love and awe for the majesty of God and creation. So this can be used to combat negative thoughts, but we're getting closer here to the ideal monastic mind. So uh, I will, for uh, the time being, uh, 
not go into, well, maybe I should just rain down some fire and brimstone rhetoric upon thee. Uh, this is an example of Pacomius's instruction on the fear of God. Let us be on guard and fearful, lest we become lovers of honor. For if, if we become lovers of honors in this age, we force God to bring the document with the shame of our actions and the thoughts of our hearts against us at the tribunal of Christ and the presence of the angels and all the saints as we are naked with no means of seeking refuge anywhere except the fire which will consume God's enemies. So you can tell I get into this. I read this stuff too much, really. <laughs> I'm not convinced myself, but it's, uh, the idea is constant repetition of these homilies uh, ingrains these practices. Uh, then prayer practice. This is another uh, Pacomian leader, Horsiasius, saying, first you need to imagine the marvel of creation. After you consider all of his marvels and the great things that he created through his word, and for your part, your littleness, because he, that is God, the powerful and eternal, created you when you did not exist so that you might come to be, and that if he had not created you or your, your contemplation itself would not exist, do not stop blessing him without cease, saying, you are a blessed Lord, the one who created me from earth when I did not exist, until the godless thought which the devil has cast into your heart completely disappears from your heart, and thus you will bless the Lord quickly and with joy. Uh, the other thing that I look at in my book, this is the last slide here, uh, is what I call collective heart work. So uh, rather than cognitive disciplines, which are uh, largely individual, you also have group rituals, which are supposed to modulate the thoughts and emotions of disciples. So you have uh, commemoration of the lives of dead uh, monastic leaders, hagiography, but uh, in a communal setting, which emphasize their inner life and prayers. Uh, and I found uh, Lisa Zunshine's 2006 work on uh, reading fiction and learning theory of mind helpful there. And then finally, ceremonies of collective repentance. So you have Shenouda and Pacomius get up and proclaim their own inner struggles, uh, but at the same time, it's not just me, they say, it's these people, we're gonna kick them out, so expelling the sinners from the monastery, but at the same time, everybody else has to expel their bad thoughts. So it's sort of like an expanded version of Peter Brown's Body and Society, where you have the heart functioning as a microcosm for the person, which is uh, then related to the macrocosm of society. And there's lots of good anthropological work on ritual and theory of mind there. So uh, that's that. I ask you to stay tuned uh, for the book. Uh, and I look forward to talking with many of you about cognitive anthropology. Thank you. Thank you.